Thank you for listening to the Well-Read Christian Podcast. I'm Mark Stanley, your host, and today we're going to look at a classic miniature novel called The Death of Ivan Ilyich from none other than Leo Tolstoy. I know, I know, you're annoyed that it's starting to seem like I've only ever even heard of Russian authors, but after our series on Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, this book was screaming at me. I reread it, and it just jumped at me, so I had to do an episode on it. You may have heard of it before, perhaps you've even read it. It's very short, only about 50 pages, which technically makes it a novella. It's too short to be a novel, uh, but too long to be a short story, so it's kind of right there in the middle. Most people could read it in less than an hour, but the effects that it could have could last a lifetime. You can get this masterpiece for free in PDF format if you Google it, which I highly encourage you to do. The story is about a man who lives his life rather ordinarily. He becomes a lawyer, excels at his career, gets married, has kids, lives a normal life, moves, gets promoted to judge, and then he gets sick, and three months later, he dies at the age of 45. The story is powerful because Tolstoy lets us zoom through this man's life and see the things that he values, the choices that he makes. And then we see him on his deathbed, realizing that his simple life, where he just kind of did everything that you're quote-unquote supposed to do, was actually a tragedy. By all external appearances, he had a good life. But now, on his deathbed, he's realizing that the world is going to pass on without him. And the things he spent the past 45 years doing was completely worthless. The reason the work is important and so incredibly impactful today is because the vanity and the emptiness of life is even more prevalent. It's even more of a temptation with social media and our culture's emphasis on financial success or finding a fulfilling career or finding interesting and fun hobbies to fill your weekends, fame, or whatever else our our culture pushes us to focus on. This story reveals so simply and beautifully that at the end of your life, If you valued the wrong things, the world will just move on after you're gone. There are plenty of people who are happy to take your great job once you're dead. The wife whom you've quarreled with and fought with your whole marriage, she won't even really mourn your death. The friends you've collected at the office, they would rather be playing cards than go to your funeral. And as Ivan is forced to reckon with the pointlessness of life and its pain and its vanity, He only sees at the last minute what he could have done differently, and then he dies. And what we're going to do in this podcast is summarize the story. I want to deliver the drama to you in a way that faithfully captures the beauty and the art of Tolstoy's prose. I want you to get caught up in the narrative so that you can naturally see ways in which uh, you've probably been living just like Ivan Ilyich and might actually die like him too if you continue to value the wrong things. And then, in the latter half of the episode, we're going to extrapolate the lessons we can learn from Ivan Ilyich's death, and, 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 and we'll apply those lessons to our own lives, so that when death comes for us, it will not be as tragic as it was for Ivan. Because all along, we have known that this was coming. We know that we're going to die. I mean, don't you know that one day, you'll close your eyes, and that'll be it? And I want you to see your life like Ivan sees it, except you don't have to see it on your deathbed. Instead of five minutes before the end, you can recognize the the things that you ought to value. Today, this weekend, this month, this year, this decade. As Sir Philip Sidney would have us do, we will both learn and delight in this beautiful piece of literature. But before we get started, please go to our social media outlets on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to support our project. Leave a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to show support and enthusiasm. If you have benefited from the podcast or believe in our mission, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to support our work on our website, wellreadchristian.com. There, you will also find interesting quotes, sources, articles, and more available free of charge. These are tough times for all of us, and if your contribution would cause any amount of financial pressure, please do not even consider it. But for those who are willing and able to give, it is because of your gift that the podcast can continue and even grow. So thank you. The story starts with a sharp and crisp Russian morning. A group of lawyers go to work and are hamming it up, talking about the latest vacations and the newest cases. One of them happens to be reading the newspaper and says, Hey, did you hear about Ivan Ilyich? He died yesterday. 
Ivan Ilyik was a fellow lawyer who had been promoted to judge only a few years back. The lawyers were shocked to hear of Ivan's death. I thought he would recover. He was only sick for three months. Did anyone even find out what he had? No, each doctor had his own theory. A shame and a pity. And such small talk ensued. Secretly and involuntarily, each man actually considered what Ivan's death would mean for the office. Who would be promoted to fill Ivan's position? Then, who would be promoted to fill the position of the man who filled Ivan's position? One man thought it would be a good opportunity to recommend his brother-in-law to get him into the office. Each man feels a slight sense of pity over their middle-aged colleague's death, but cannot help but feel glad that it was he who died, and not they. The conversation continues, with each lawyer making excuses to each other and themselves why they couldn't visit Ivan while he was sick. Some say they thought he would recover. Others say it was too much trouble and they were just really busy. One man, who lives over the river, says, I couldn't visit him, it was too far of a drive. <laughs> the subject changes when everyone else teases that man for living over the river. I know, I know, I'm cursed because I live over the bridge. They laugh and go back to work, slightly annoyed at the realization that they will have to pay respects to Ivan's family later that evening. There goes another weekend, too, when they plan his funeral. Piotr Ivanovich is slightly more sympathetic than the rest. After all, they had been friends for decades, since law school. After work, the colleagues go and visit Ivan's estate. In the recently dead man's household, things are not much different. The family is a little dazed. Praskovia, Ivan's widow, asks privately to pull Piotr aside and ask about Ivan's pension from the government. The conversation is, on the surface, about the government's office, Ivan's position, and the state treasury. But Piotr realizes that Ivan's widow is really asking about whether the government will give them any more money, since the deceased man was the judge. Piotr says something about the government's greed to get out of the conversation, and the widow understands and tries to change the subject. Eventually, more friends show up at Ivan's house to pay condolences, but nobody really knows what to do. After visiting the corpse in the upstairs bedroom and crossing themselves, they find themselves standing around, not really knowing how to act. Eventually, someone asks whether the card game at 7 p.m. is canceled. They conclude that it isn't indecent to play cards, even though on a normal day, Ivan actually would have joined them. The lawyers awkwardly tip their hats one last time and go off to play cards, thankful that their condolences didn't take too much of their time. Piotr stays behind a while longer and asks Praskovia, the widow, if Ivan died peacefully. She shook her head, saying that Ivan had been screaming in abdominal pain for the three nights before his death. Even within minutes of his final passing, he had been screaming. Piotr shudders at the description and even gets some anxiety from it. The man wasn't much older than he is. But he is comforted when he remembers that this is someone else who died and not him. He is perfectly healthy. Then again, so was Ivan three months ago. Piotr sighs, nods, and stays an extra hour after the departure of most of the other guests. Then he resigns himself to leave. When his carriage driver asks where to, he thinks, I guess it's not too late. And he asks to go to Fyodor Vasilevich's house to play Vint, their popular card game of choice. Tolstoy begins his story at the end in order to show us what became of Ivan's life. After all, no matter what you do with your life, you are going to die. Don't you know this? Of course you know this. But even when we imagine our own death, we imagine it as spectators, as a detached narrator, perhaps. Our culture has such strange attitudes towards death. We treat it like it's just a part of life, like going to the bathroom or our requirements to eat. We don't think about it at all, ever. <laughs> and when we do, it's just this distant, detached reality. That is, of course, unless some imperialist power is uh, at fault for the death of said person, and then we we're outraged as if the worst thing in the world was the fact that this person died. That's actually an observation that uh, Ravi Zacharias made. Our attitude towards death is perplexing, to say the least. When we think about our own death, we simply don't even believe it. Not really. We don't think about our own death as something that will happen. Or if we do, it's just like, well, yeah, sure, I'm going to pay my taxes next year, I guess. It's just, it's a fact. It's, it's not a truth. Seeing how someone else dies from natural or ordinary causes can sometimes wake us up to the mortality of life. But we quickly try to dismiss it and forget it and, and move on with whatever else is going on. When we see Ivan's death, with his wife being partly sympathetic and partly relieved, 
with his friends being more concerned about their card game than Ivan's corpse, we're invited to consider what people actually think about death. What Tolstoy does, after showing this to us, is to go back to examine Ivan's life so that we can have the context of how it ended this way. The horrifying truth is that he was a good and decent ordinary fellow, probably just like you and me, with similar flaws and similar goals. As a matter of fact, Tolstoy introduces the next part with the line, quote, The past history of Ivan Ilyich's life is most simple, most ordinary, and most terrible. End quote. Ivan Ilyich was a bright young man. His father was also a government worker and made good money. Ivan excelled at school, had fun as a youth, worked hard at his studies, and eventually got an excellent job with a good salary as a young bachelor. Life was good. He had money. He had social status. Everyone always knows and admires a new, young, and successful person in town. And he had looks. He attracted the attention of the most beautiful woman in the social circles, Praskovia Fyodorovna. She was beautiful, funny, interesting, and she fell in love with him while they danced. They seemed like a match made in heaven, and Ivan liked Praskovia just fine. And so he asked himself, why not get married? She's nice enough, beautiful, and we make a good couple. After marriage, there were a few years of joyous married life things. New furniture, a new house, new dishes, the caress of a lover. Life was good. Ivan thought marriage would do nothing to disturb his perfect, easy existence. But eventually the magic wore off. Praskovia demanded that Ivan continue to pursue her even after they got married. She was dissatisfied with the realities of everyday marriage and wanted to continue going on lavish dates and being the most exciting people in the room. She got very jealous of his time, and the two fought about how often he would play cards with his colleagues or go to the office on a weekend. The result of this marital conflict was that Ivan spent most of his time at work in order to avoid the complications of home life. This only got worse when Praskovia became pregnant and had children. Ivan understood children even less than he understood his wife, but eventually he found a happy equilibrium with his family and his work. He enjoyed simple pleasures like dinner and theater, but used his work to shield himself from the bulk of parenthood or husbandhood. As his wife continued to get more and more angry with him, and their relationship continued to deteriorate, he spent more time inviting guests over, playing cards with the guys, and working overtime at the office. The ugliest things got was one summer when they actually hosted a soiree, which is a party and with dancing and such. Praskavia thought that Ivan had spent too much money on the pastries, and the two jabbed at each other all night culminating in a shouting match in front of everyone, with curses and threats of divorce. But that's over as bad as it got, and despite the years which drug on like this, there were islands of peace between them, and Ivan learned to ignore the pain of family life. The children kept coming, and the Ivan Ilyak Golovin family began spending outside of their means. Ivan moved to a different town after he was stood up for a promotion twice, and this was hard on his family. But he got a good new position, and they decorated their new home in a way that people that want to look rich do. But Tolstoy notes that everyone who wants to look rich doesn't look rich. They just look like the, everyone else who also wants to look rich. Eventually, life went back to normal. They went back to having important guests for dinner, living their married life as slightly annoyed roommates do, and carrying on their daily activities. One day, however, Ivan experienced a sharp pain in his side coupled with a bad taste in his mouth. This goes on for quite some time, and eventually Ivan ends up taking sick days and calling doctors as the pain becomes unbearable. He is frustrated at the doctors because they treat him like a puzzle to be solved or a machine to be fixed, but never a human being. He never gets a straight answer about how serious his condition might be. He is constantly asking them, so could it be this or that? Is it serious? Do I need to pursue treatment immediately? Should I take time off work? But whatever he asks, they just kind of frown and give technical jargon which doesn't seem to make sense to the average person. They are constantly trying to interpret or, or understand various phenomena, but it's always Ivan who's sitting there scratching his head wanting a straight answer. Is this serious? Is there a treatment? When can I go back to normal life? But as he finds more and more prestigious doctors from farther and farther corners of the Russian nation, this problem only gets worse. At first, Ivan tries to live as he normally would. But when he does, the bad taste in his mouth, and even his splitting abdominal pain, makes it unbearable. 
In order to cope with the pain, he tries to throw himself back into his work, double down on his ambitions and his career. But this becomes a real challenge. And when he takes time off of work and devotes himself to doctors and specialists, still nothing gets better. As Ivan's extreme anxiety grows and word spreads about his medical condition, the people around him don't even really seem to care. Even Ivan's wife is just frustrated with him. Look, either be sick and try to recover, or don't be sick and stop complaining. Sometimes Ivan wants to be understood and sympathized and treated like a sick child, and other times he just wants to pretend like he's not sick at all and, and go on with his life, stay up late, keep playing cards, don't worry too much about the medicine, try to laugh and have fun. But the more he continues to live life normally, the worse his pain and sickness gets, and the more he tries to be a recluse and just get better, the more nothing really seems to happen. Everyone else is just continuing on with their daily lives, even as Ivan's illness gets worse and worse. Not only does nobody understand Ivan's pain, nobody even really wants to understand Ivan's pain. They are more concerned with their own social status or their own weekend plans or their own engagement with their career. They don't really care that Ivan's being left behind or has to go to the bathroom to cope with his pain or shouts uncontrollably sometimes. One day, Ivan's brother-in-law comes to visit from out of town, and when Ivan opens the front door, he's visibly disturbed. What? Ivan asks him. He doesn't respond, but the look in his eyes says everything. Ivan is irritated with him. Have I changed? The brother-in-law doesn't answer. Ivan stormed off. Later that night, he overhears his brother-in-law talk with his wife. Don't you see him? Yes, brother, he is getting better. Getting better? He's a dead man already. What do the doctors say? What's wrong with him? They don't know. Some say a floating kidney. Others say something else. But stop exaggerating. Exaggerating? Pavia, have you seen him? Look at his eyes. Look at his gait. Ivan stopped listening. He went off to look in a mirror intensely. He sees for the first time what everyone else has been seeing gradually. His eyes are drooping. His skin looks ashen. His back is hunching. He looks at his arms, skinnier than he remembers, and they seem alien. He makes eye contact with himself. The corners of his mouth bend into a sad arc, and he realizes he's going to die. But so will everyone else, right? Well, yes, but he, he will die. He parodies the lessons in logic from law school. All men are mortal. Ivan is a man. Therefore, Ivan is mortal. It seems so simple, so obvious, but now it really meant something. All mortals die. Ivan is a mortal. Therefore, Ivan will die. But how could nobody care? How could his colleagues go on playing cards as they always have? How could his wife not shed a single tear so far, but actually blame him for not doing more about it? Nobody actually cares about him, and he's realizing this for the first time. As the weeks go on, the health and vigor of everyone else around him just annoy him. People started offering to do things for him, at work and at home, and he realizes that people are starting to treat him as if he's actually going to die, but they never admit it. It's always, no, no, I, I would do this for anyone, or, or, no, it has nothing to do with your illness, just let me do it for you. That was another thing. Ivan knew deep down in his heart that he was dying. He wasn't just sick, he was dying. This wasn't a strange occurrence. He wanted people to admit that this is the normal course of life and that he was dying just like everyone else in history. Yet everyone looked at him with a strangeness, a distant pity which passed over as soon as he was out of sight. But no one would admit that Ivan was dying. They all knew what was going on, but they hid it from themselves and especially from him. Only one of Ivan's servants, named Garrison, seemed to take true pity on Ivan. He would stay up late at night, taking care of him. He would help position Ivan in the bed so that he wasn't in pain. Much to Ivan's chagrin, he placed a commode next to Ivan's bed so they didn't have to walk so far to the bathroom. He even cleaned it and eventually helped him pull down his pants and then pull him back up when he needed to use it. Ivan grew weaker and weaker, and even though Ivan insisted on doing everything himself, Gerizim would assure him from the heart, It's okay, sir. We all die. I just hope that when it's my time, someone will help me too. Garrison was the only man whom Ivan didn't resent for his strength and 
and vigor. He was also the only man who wouldn't lie to him, who just told him straight out, Yeah, you're dying, but, but I'm going to be here for you, sir. Ivan hadn't gone to work in weeks. He became bedridden, and his wife was too busy with the children and, and her own affairs to really help him. Even when she did help, he didn't really appreciate it. It just made him angry. Oh, look at you. You think you're so special because you can still walk, because you're still healthy, because you can do things for me. It angered him that she didn't understand nor want to understand him. Even she wouldn't admit that he was really dying, that he was going to die. She just kept treating it like it was an illness and he'll recover any day if he only takes his medicine. Gerizim soon became Ivan's only true sympathizer and companion. One day, after a particularly painful night of misery, Ivan dismissed Gerizim and was alone. The sun was setting out the window, and Ivan struggled to sit up and enjoy the view. His lips trembled and his eyes narrowed. He wanted someone to swoop into the room and catch him in their arms, weeping and caressing him like a child, but there was no one. Ivan burst into tears and wails, falling into the fetal position on his bed. He stifled his cries so that no one could hear him, because whenever someone did visit, he felt compelled to keep up a stern and thoughtful appearance. The relationship with his wife was always confrontational and distant, and so he had no one. Here he was, weeping on his bed, knowing that he was going to die, and all he has is a web of indifferent acquaintances and an estranged family who happens to live in his house and share his last name. He has grown to hate his wife, even when she shows kindness or pity, because she still doesn't understand him, nor does she want to. She is observing the death of her husband from arm's length, only engaging with him to complete a task or offer pithy emotional support, like, don't worry, you'll get better, just take your medicine. No, Ivan would feel like shouting, I won't get better, I'm going to die, and the world will be happier without me, it will move on as if I never even came. There was no one there to enter Ivan's pain and share it with him. The worst part of Ivan's condition, the reason he weeps with the fury of a child, is because he realizes that even if he were to recover, he could never go back to the way things were. His life was superfluous and vain. All his best memories were from childhood, and the older he grew, the more success that he found, the more meaningless and empty things he piled on as a result. Only now, when he was staring death in the face, did he consider the idea that perhaps he lived life wrongly. Lived life wrongly? What? What does that even mean? How can you live life wrongly? He thought. His life looked just like everyone else's life. He got a job. He got married. He has kids. He found a work-family equilibrium. He's a successful and prominent judge. He was healthy until he wasn't. What could he have done wrong? He did everything right. And so he pushed the thought away. Even so, the riddle of life and death troubled him. What in the world was going on? How could life be so meaningless and vile and then end? How could it be that now, after 45 years, he was going to die young? And how is it that he is caught between wanting to die already and wanting to recover and go on just as things were before? How could it be that he suspects that he has lived life wrongly? but also that he has no idea what he would have done differently. How could he be so angry with how his life has turned out, but simultaneously not be able to conceptualize what a more fulfilling life would even look like? The last week of Ivan's life was not a thoughtful one. Ivan was overtaken by cutting abdominal pain, which made him scream in agony and cry. For three days straight, day and night, he shouted in pain and misery. His children wept in fear, from being able to hear their father pass three locked doors. His wife came in to try and offer some medicine, but Ivan knew from experience that it had never, not once, helped. He scolded her and sent her away. Ivan knew he had mere hours left, but hours turned into days, and the pain continued. He kept thinking about life when he could between his agony. What is life? Did he live a good life? He kept telling himself that he had, but he didn't believe it. He screamed and yelled in pain, only to be relieved for enough time to weep and be caught up in more excruciating pain again. On the morning of his last day alive, in the last scene of the story, Ivan is thrashing about in bed, screaming and howling uncontrollably. In his wails, his hand hits the head of his six-year-old son, 
who had snuck into the room to cry. The child is surprised by the accidental blow, but he clasps his hand and hugs it, crying while he does. Ivan is silenced immediately and looks at his son, whom he has barely interacted with before his illness, and whom he hasn't really seen since he fell ill. The child has tears streaming down his face, and he kisses the hand of his father. In that moment, Ivan realizes what his howls of pain have been doing to his family. His six-year-old son has listened to his father die in agony for three days. He stands here now, sobbing. Ivan himself has tears form in his eyes, and he suppresses his pain long enough to take a good look at his son. The door opens and Proskovia enters. She, too, has unwiped tears in her cheeks and nose. Her mouth gaped in astonishment and pain. Daggers explode in Ivan's stomach, but he doesn't care. He suppresses it. He realizes that he's been torturing those around him with his shouts. He realizes the best thing he can do is bear his pain silently and die. He looks at his family as they pour into the room. The doctor comes in too. Ivan sees at once what he's done with his whole life, what he's done with his sickness, what he's done with these past few days. He realizes that something must be done. He indicates with his eyes for his six-year-old son to be taken away. He wants all of his family to go away. He doesn't want them to have to watch him die. He wanted to say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for everything. Forgive me. For all time, forgive me. But he only had the strength to utter the first syllable of the word, forgive. He saw that he wouldn't have the time to explain his feelings. He waved his hand in a way so that the one who needed to understand might be able to, if not now, perhaps later in life. Ivan laid in bed, silent now, reflecting on this simple answer. For the first time, he wanted to ease the sufferings of the people around him and not just himself. For the first time, he wanted to understand them and not just be understood himself. For the first time, he was no longer afraid of death. And for the first time, pain seemed so meaningless. He discovered how to fix his life, how to live well. For him, this all happened in an instant. He fell silent, his chest gurgled, and tried to bear his pain in silence. For two hours, he said nothing, did nothing, thought nothing. It's finished, someone said over him. He heard those words and repeated them in his soul. Death is finished, he said to himself. It is no more. He drew in air, stopped mid-breath, stretched it out, and died. Tolstoy wasn't exactly an Orthodox Christian, but he certainly believed in Christian values and thought himself a believer. It's hard not to see the allusion to what Jesus said on the cross before he died when he too said, it is finished. The powerful lesson that Ivan Ilyich learned right before he passed was that life is not about your career, your superficial friends, the pleasure of card games played after work every day for years, the antique clock which Ivan took great pleasure in after he moved and was promoted to being a judge, or being understood or loved yourself. It doesn't matter that his house was full of decorated things in order to look richer than he was. It doesn't matter that he had powerful and important guests. None of that mattered when he died at 45 years old. It wouldn't have mattered if he recovered and went on to live until he was 85. What Ivan learned before his death is that the only thing worth living for is understanding and loving other people. In the end, a literary critic might point out that he became a Christ figure, suffering for the sake of others out of virtue by internalizing his pain instead of projecting it outward in order to try to earn pity. What Tolstoy portrays so clearly and so vividly and so powerfully, without being preachy, is show us what death could be like for us. He shows us what life we might be living, what life thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of other people are actually living. How many people find themselves on their deathbeds and the people around them are more concerned about whether it's socially acceptable to still play cards at 7 p.m.? How many people live lives centered on their careers and their prestige, not at all noticing that their family life is in shambles and it's getting worse and worse and, and everything that they do is superficial and vain and has been every day since childhood? And you know, 
it's not right to say that they don't notice the decline. They notice it, just like I even noticed it. But, but he chooses to ignore it. That's the right way of, 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 of thinking about it. And that's what, that's what the death of Ivanilin is about. It's about a man who says, ah, family life is kind of messy. I'll just spend a little more time at work. Oh, for crying out loud. My wife is just a little, ugh. I'll just stay away a little more often. I don't understand this child. I, I think I'll just go play cards with the guys. Wow, this is really cool. I'm going to get into antique clocks. Every day, we notice the tips of icebergs, which are submerged beneath civility and politeness. But every now and then, we see the years of resentment and anger and jealousy and bitterness that can be deep within ourselves that, that we don't notice because we're just suppressing it. But it's not fair to say that we don't really know. Sometimes it comes out in little fights, and then we shove it back under the surface. And only now and then, in really big fights, does it all come out. Like we see when Ivan Ilyich and his wife threaten for divorce and are screaming at each other in that one dance party they threw. We bury ourselves in our jobs and our careers and our social hobbies or our ministries even. And the next thing you know, you're 45 years old. Everyone's healthy until they're not. Everything's great until something comes along and shakes the illusion that we built for ourselves, which says that every day is just like the last and what happens tomorrow will be the same thing that happened yesterday. So there's no need to change or do anything different. Sometimes it's hard to be blamed for this. You know, we got things to pay attention to. The electric bills, grocery shopping, impulsive pleasures, hobbies, the housing market, whatever we're doing. But it's so easy to think that there's no reason to really empathize or love someone else. There's no real reason to not bury your frustration with life. No reason to think about religion or family. Why? It just doesn't come up. No reason to build a lasting relationship. The point of the death of Ivan Illich is to break the illusion for you and get you to see that your life could be just like Ivan's is. Death is not an irrelevant fact of life. You will die. You, whoever is listening to this, will one day find that it is your last day. Your years are numbered. Your months are numbered. Your days are numbered. Eventually, you will die and be forgotten. Even if you cure cancer, people will just remember you as the guy who cured cancer. They won't actually remember you. <laughs> Do you remember the guy who invented the polio vaccine? Do you care? Probably not. No one will remember that Ivan had a prestigious job as a famous judge. No one cares. So, what matters? Well, work buddies and important acquaintances? That doesn't matter. Impulsive pleasure? That doesn't matter. At all. Ivan Ilyich spent more time playing cards with the guys than anything else. And when he died, his friends went on playing cards that very day. What matters is deep and lasting relationships. Virtue and character matters. Surrounding yourself with people of virtue and character matters. Loving the people around you matters. That's Tolstoy's message. But you know what? I'm going to go a step beyond Tolstoy here. Is it that much better to die with virtue, having lived a good life, surrounded by loving family? Obviously, that's infinitely better than the alternative. But I'm going to say that if in both cases, death is just the end, then it is, by definition, irrelevant whether you lived a happy life or a sad life. Whether, when you die, you have people around you who understand you and love you, or people around you who just kind of hope you would get on with it already. Let me ask you like this. If Christianity is true, would you want to know? And if you're already a Christian, do you see God's existence and Jesus' sacrifice to make you right with God and yada yada yada? Do you see this as a mere fact? Or as a relevant truth? Are you living your life in any real different way than Ivan Ilyich? Hmm. Maybe you have more virtue, maybe your family life is better, but then you die. And then what? Will you be meeting God for the first time? Or will you already have known him intimately for years? Because when Ivan Ilyich fell sick, there was a really long time where he still considered his impending death as a fact and not as a truth. 
you might think that I'm splicing hairs here, but I'm trying to use these words differently. You see, a fact is just something that's irrelevant. Did you know that the sun is 94 million miles away? That's a fact. Do you care? Does it matter? Did you know that crows are one of the most intelligent species on Earth, even being known to craft tools and fish with bait? That's a fact. But do you care? Does it matter? Do you think about it? There are an infinite number of facts, including the fact that you and everyone else you know are going to die. But do you ever think about that? Not really. As a matter of fact, you might actually think less of me or call me morbid because I'm pointing out the fact that you and everyone you know are going to die. We prefer not to think about death, but it is one of the most relevant and important truths that you can remember. It's not just a fact, it's a truth. People say that thinking about life and death is laughable. Of course we don't know what's going to happen when we die. Probably nothing, so stop talking about fairy tales. <laughs> but you know what else people say? They also say that science is the only way to knowledge, which itself is not a scientific statement and therefore cannot be a way to knowledge. They also say that they don't care what people think of them, but they absolutely do think what people think of them. There are people who think that chocolate milk comes from brown cows or that the earth is flat. There are people who think that there are no right or wrong religious answers and that religion is just a hobby, but then they also believe in horoscopes and zodiac signs. Why in the world would you listen to people? What do they know? Why would you be so intimidated from asking deep questions because of the opinion of other people? And when you die, they might be the same people who are secretly miffed that they have to suffer through your funeral. So who cares what they think? The fact of the matter is that thinking about Christianity, evaluating whether it's true or not, and then recognizing that if it's true, it's not merely a fact, but it is a revolutionary and life-changing truth, that's the most important thing in life. Everything else is ultimately vain and superfluous. And I feel like this ending detracts from the beauty of Tolstoy's novella, but it's hard to reconcile which is more valuable, the beauty of the art itself or its message. Tolstoy wrote for the sake of the message, but he did it with such beauty that it carries power even today. I considered just ending the episode right after I concluded the story without you know trying to tarnish it with my vague explanations and rants and there is some sense in which the story carries such weight and power that its message is self-evident i also couldn't help but interject along the way certain at certain scenes and things but but alas i also couldn't help ranting and explaining what perhaps doesn't need explanation at the end of the day i think i'm i think it's more effective to rant than uh, rely on my storytelling skills just because there's no way I could communicate the beauty and the impact of this story by repeating it, unless I just read it to you, which I also consider doing. In any case, the profundity and the importance of this book shine forth, and I hope that you read it and savor all the little things that I wasn't able to cover in this masterpiece of a brief story. Tolstoy communicates powerfully the psychological realities of death, our indifference to it, our lack of belief in our own death, and the impact our inevitable doom ought to have in our lives. Tolstoy wrote in order to try and get us to see what vain and empty lives we live. He tried to show us how vice and a neglect of family life result in true tragedy. He tried to point out that a life of external success is actually one of complete failure if you fail to see the true fulfillment, which only comes from living for other people. Instead of being jacked up about whether you are appreciated or you are understood or you are loved, that is actually not going to matter when you're on your deathbed. Loving and understanding and cherishing other people is what's going to matter. And as we read this tale of an ordinary man in his ordinary, albeit early death at 45 years old, we cannot help but consider the importance of thinking about what it means to live a meaningful life and what life's brevity means for asking deep questions about God, the meaning of life, and life after death. I couldn't help but read this story and think, man, if, if this really is life, even if Tolstoy is right about, hey, you know, live life meaningfully and, and focus on family, even if all that's true, if you just die and that's it, life is still pretty pointless and painful. <laughs> this is why I couldn't help but draw the afterlife uh, 
point, I guess, because it's just so important to think, hey, if you die and meet God, you don't want that to be the first time. You really don't. If Christianity is true, you need to know. You need to know about it. And in my experience, the reason people don't want to ask these questions or think about this kind of thing is just because it's embarrassing. People think, wow, what are, what are people going to think of me if I'm actually seriously considering life after death, as if I can know the difference? Well, it turns out that if Jesus did die and was resurrected, we can know because he said something about it. <laughs> he told us what it was like to die and come back. If Jesus really is God and Christianity is true, then we need to base our lives in that reality. And so I hope my message doesn't dilute the power of the story. And I hope that the story itself uh, reminds you what to value. Because that is the hardest thing to get right in life. What do we value? Where do we place our time? What do we think is important? And God and family are pretty dang important. And I really hope that the story helps remind you to orient your life towards things that are important. Otherwise, you just might end up horribly sick at 45 years old with a lot of regrets. In the end, I don't think the death of Ivan Ilyich is a tragedy because he sees what life should have been like. And he also sees how he can live rightly in those last few moments where he truly understands and loves his family for the first time. And you know what? Some people never learn to value the right things, even five minutes before their death. I hope you're not one of those people. Thank you for listening to the Well-Read Christian Podcast. This only gets worse the more and more prestigious doctors from even farther from the corners of the Russian nation he finds them. That was a trash sentence. <laughs> he remembers his lessons in logic from lawyer school. Law school? Lawyer school. He remembers his lessons from law school. <laughs> okay, just recorded.